I'm actually very excited for this next panel uh, to talk about uh, eyewitness identification and next steps in reform. Um, one of the key uh, structural precepts of the Quattrone Center is an interdisciplinary approach, so not just using lawyers, but actually bringing social scientists in to tackle questions. I think one of the things that you heard from Mark Holden and from Rachel Barkow uh, that I truly believe is when you ask different questions about a problem that people have faced, you end up coming up with different answers. And by bringing social science into the conversation of criminal justice reform, we find that they ask different questions uh, than lawyers often ask, and that leads us to different answers. Um, you may wonder where I'm going with this. Rachel looks like she's wondering where I'm going with this. Uh, and the answer is that, that our center is headed by a lawyer and an economist, and when we hire fellows, each year we bring in uh, a legal fellow and a social science fellow. The fellows will be some of our uh, panel moderators this year, and so uh, Rachel Greenspan is a, 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 her year's social scientist. She's a, a psychologist. I uh, got her PhD at UC Irvine in the lab of Elizabeth Loftus. Uh, and she asks different questions, and that helps us get to different answers. So uh, I'm going to let her take it away and introduce the panel from here. But uh, it's a great topic. It's a wonderful panel. And uh, we're really excited to hear what you guys have to say. Thanks, John. Uh, just so that everyone's on the same page for questions, we're going to want to leave a lot of time for questions at the end. So uh, you guys all have note cards. So if you have questions, please feel free to write them on the note card. And somebody will be coming around and collecting them so that we can answer them. I'm really excited to be here today. As John said, uh, I'm a fellow here at the Quattrone Center, and my research looks at questions at the intersection of psychology and the legal system. A lot of my research has been on eyewitness identifications and eyewitness confidence. So I'm really excited to be here today with our three distinguished panelists to talk about this important question. So from data from the Innocence Project and the National Registry of Exonerations, we know that eyewitnesses aren't always correct and that misidentifications are a significant and frequent contributor to wrongful convictions. And there's lots of reasons why an eyewitness may make a mistaken identification. Some of these factors have to do with what occurs during the crime. So whether the witness has a long time to view the perpetrator or whether the lighting is good. But this isn't the only thing that affects identifications. Uh, rather, the process of making an identification is an interactive process between the witness and the police. So when the witness comes into the police station and looks at a lineup, uh, whether the lineup is created in an unbiased way, whether the questions are asked in a suggestive manner or not, affect the likelihood of an accurate ID. And not only police that interact with identifications, but lots of other actors in the legal system as well. So when prosecutors make charging decisions, they have to weigh the value of the evidence, whether the procedures that elicited the identification are suggestive or not. Jurors have to hear the witness speak and the police about the identification and deter determine whether it's probative of guilt. And judges have the role of determining whether those jurors need to hear jury instructions or from an expert witness about whether the identification may be unreliable. And all of this is underscored by the fact that an eyewitness's <coughs> identification is one of the most persuasive pieces of evidence in the justice system. So there's few things more powerful than a witness pointing to the suspect and saying that they're sure that that's the person that committed the crime. And so because of its powerfulness and its potential for error, there are a lot of questions about how the justice system should deal with eyewitness evidence. And that's going to be the focus of our panel today. So the goal of our panel is to talk about what the state of the field is regarding best practices for eyewitness evidence and how the legal system should handle it throughout the life cycle of a case. And to do that, we have three experts here who have experience both conducting research, serving as expert witnesses, and training police and prosecutors about identification evidence. On the far end, our first panelist is the Honorable Theodore McKee, who serves as a judge on the US Court of Appeals for the Third Circuit. He was nominated and confirmed in 1994 and served as chief judge from 2010 to 2016. He received his JD from Syracuse University, and in 2016, he created and co-chaired the Third Circuit Task Force on Eyewitness Identifications. The task force aimed to promote reliable practices for identifications and to reduce suggestive procedures, including things like creating jury instructions and guidelines for the, the use of expert testimony. Next, we have uh, Dr. Margaret Covera. Professor Covera is a presidential scholar and professor of psychology at John Jay College of Criminal Justice in New York. She received her PhD in social psychology from the University of Minnesota, 
and her published articles include topics about jury decision making and eyewitness identification evidence. She currently serves as a member of the American Psychology and Law Society's scientific review paper on identifications, which she's going to talk about in a bit, recommending best practices for the collection and preservation of identification evidence. And finally, we have Professor Jules Epstein. Professor Epstein is a professor of law and the director of advocacy programs at Temple University. He received his JD from here at Penn Law and previously served as an adjunct professor at Penn. He also served as a reviewer on the National Academy of Sciences report on eyewitness issues and conducts training about identifications for judges, police, and prosecutors. He's written articles on the admissibility of eyewitness evidence in court and also participated with Judge McKee on the Third Circuit Task Force. I'm really excited to have our three panelists here today. The way that the panel is going to go is that initially each of our three speakers is going to have some time to present on their area of expertise. After that, we'll have some discussion amongst the panel members and leave plenty of time for questions from you at the end. So to begin, we have Professor Covert uh, to speak on the best practice procedures for police for identifications. Loud. Um, so, as uh, Rachel mentioned, I am a member of the scientific review paper panel on eyewitness identification that's been commissioned by the American Law, uh, Psychology Law Society, which is the largest uh, academic society for forensic psychologists really in the world. Um, and basically, what we're doing is following up on the first paper that was written um, in 1998. Um, at that time, uh, Gary Wells led a group of scholars who put together four recommendations that were based on the science that we had at that time um, that we recommended the police should follow um, when collecting eyewitness evidence in order to make it uh, more reliable. Um, the four recommendations were that witnesses should be given an instruction that the perpetrator may or may not be present in the lineup, that fillers should be chosen so that the suspect does not stand out from the fillers, that a confident statement should be taken from the witness immediately after the identification decision, and that uh, the police officer should conduct what's called a double-blind lineup administration. What that basically means is that in the traditional single-blind administration, you have a police officer conducting the lineup who knows who the suspect is and who knows who the fillers are in the lineup. Uh, presumably the witness does not, but certainly in my consulting, I have seen many times in which the police have tipped off the witness to who the suspect is that they're considering in a variety of ways. Um, that would not be single blind either, even if the officer does not know who the suspect is, if the witness knows. Um, but what we're recommending is that neither the witness nor the person conducting the lineup know um, who, the, who the suspect is in the lineup. Um, the reason we do that is because we know that uh, the officers can emit even unintentionally subtle cues that uh, cue the witness to who the suspect is, and it increases the likelihood that the witness will pick the suspect, not based on their memory, but because of the social cues being omitted. Um, this original paper in 1998 was pretty influential. I'll just take the case of double blind lineup administration. When it was published, this is the number of states that had it, none. Um, <laughs> and now, uh, a little over half of the states have adopted this procedure. So it actually did have some impact, but we figured that in 20 years, perhaps the science had progressed a little bit and that we might be able to revisit the recommendations, see if they still held and if there were any new ones that we wanted to make. Um, there are. Um, so basically, this is the new panel of people, and I have to give credit to Gary Wells, Amy Douglas, Neil Brewer, Chris Meisner, and John Wickstead, who are my co-authors on this new set of recommendations that I'll be presenting today. Just real briefly so you understand what the process is of the American Psychology Law Society adopting recommendations. Um, I'm the past president of the organization. I served on the executive committee for more years than I care to claim because it makes me very old. Um, and they never take a position on anything they, publicly. They don't advocate, that's not their, they don't see that as their role. They've taken two positions in the history of the organization, 
and these best practices on eyewitnesses are one of them. And so the executive committee of that group convenes a panel of experts, um, also with some people who are likely to disagree with the others so that there's somebody there keeping them honest um, and so that all these recommendations are evidence-based. Um, the document is posted to a public website. The entire membership and anybody else who happens to get to the web website can give comments on the recommendations. Um, it is presented at two conferences, the American Psychological Association Conference in the summer and the APLS um, conference in March. And it is eventually then um, sent out for an initial set of peer review before it even goes to a journal. It then goes through peer review at a journal before it is ever adopted as position. Right now, we are at the stage that it's been publicly vetted at two conferences. It has been revised. We've asked for comment from police chiefs and prosecutors and defense attorneys. The Innocence Project has given us advice on it as well. Um, and so it's got, we're pretty far down the process and it's just about to be submitted for peer review. But I just want to give you that background so you understand that these are not just the six of our recommendations, but they are really recommendations coming from the entire field. Um, the first recommendation, and I'm, I was given 10 minutes to go through nine recommendations and give you background. So that's not possible. I'm going to do my best, but that's why I also I'm talking very fast. Um, the first one is perhaps controversial, but it's the one I like the best. Um, we are recommending that there be an evidence-based reason for placing a suspect in the lineup. This is new. This was not in the earlier version. Um, and the reason why we're recommending this is we believe that there is a base rate problem in lineup procedures or any identification procedure that is conducted by police today. Um, there are no current guidelines or requirements or restrictions for placing a person in a lineup. A police officer can have a mere hunch and put somebody in a lineup. Um, and an estimate from one of the largest jurisdictions in the US suggested that the culprit was present in only 35%. That's not, I didn't make a mistake. It's not the opposite. 35% is the estimate of guilty suspects in identification procedures. Um, in another field study, only 40% of lineups had any evidence at all other than the eyewitness identification. And so what we're asking for is that police officers have an evidence-based articulable reason for placing somebody in an ID procedure to try and increase the base rate of guilt among suspects. We don't test for prostate cancer in 20-year-old men. We don't test for breast and screen women who are in their 20s for breast cancer. There's a reason, the screening works. The problem is at that age, there are so few cases of those cancers that most of the hits that we would get from those screening tests are false positives. And the same thing would be true if you have this type of low base rate of guilt among culprits. Um, you're going to have a lot of false positives. And we believe that the fastest way to change the rate of mistaken identifications is by adopting this procedure in an attempt to increase the, the base rate of guilt of suspects. Okay, we also recommended uh, a new recommendation for a pre-lineup interview. So as soon as the witness reports um, the crime to the police, uh, the police should memorialize the eyewitness's description of the culprit, the viewing conditions that they had when they were um, viewing the crime, how much attention they were paying, and any claims of prior familiarity with the culprit. Too often we see people saying they're familiar with the person they've identified in the lineup only after they've made the identification of somebody who was in their surrounding, you know, somebody who lived in their neighborhood or something like that. But that never came up initially. So we want to have that documented at the beginning. Um, and we want, at that time, the police to instruct the witnesses to not discuss the event with anybody else, especially other co-witnesses and to stop trying to identify the perpetrator on their own because we're finding that um, the uh, burgeoning of social media that we're having a lot of the first identifications made by witnesses coming from Facebook pages or Instagram. And those are not good procedures for making an identification. And so we want to specifically warn people not to do that, that it will help, that it would damage their case. Um, we are recommending again a double blind lineup. We have included um, an equivalent version uh, in this go round, which we did not in the initial 
uh, recommendations. So basically we're, again, recommending that blind administrators be used for administrating lineups because non-blind administrators influence witnesses' choices. They're more likely to pick the suspect. It influences their confidence. They get feedback that, yay, you picked the suspect. <laughs> and all of a sudden they're like, I'm really certain that's it. Um, <laughs> And so you inflate the confidence of the witness when you have a non-blind administrator. And there's also some data suggesting that administrators don't record all the behaviors of a witness when they know they've picked someone other than the suspect. And that we believe that that information is really crucial um, for the prosecution and, and defense of um, these cases. Um, our low-tech method is a self-administered envelope method in which the non-blind administrator instructs the witness um, and provides the witness with a sealed envelope and, and that has the pictures of uh, the, uh, the suspect and the fillers in it, that they are given a form with instructions on how to look at the photos, make their pick, record their pick, record their confidence, and then seal it all back up and hand it to the administrator who's in an outside room waiting um, and nowhere near the witness while they're looking at the materials. And we think that that might be a way um, of um, doing a low-tech version of, of double blind uh, in those departments that are resource uh, scarce. Um, but we also think it should be videotaped to prove that they actually did it, but that's a quite <laughs> coming later. Um, um, our lineup fillers recommendation is basically the same. There should only be one suspect per lineup. The lineup should contain at least five appropriate fillers, and the fillers should not make the suspect stand out. Um, in terms of instructions, we kept the old instruction. You should warn the, the witness that the culprit may or may not be in the lineup, but you also need to tell them they don't need to select anybody. They don't, uh, that the lineup administrator doesn't know who, which lineup member is the suspect. Um, they need to state their confidence after making the identification, so we warn them that they're going to have to do that so they don't see the request for how confident are you as a cue that they may or may not be right. Um, and the investigation will continue even if no identification is made. Um, and we're recommending, based on some research, that witnesses be given explicitly a don't know option so that they know it's okay to say, it's not that the culprit's not there, but they're just not sure, and that's a reasonable response. Um, the confidence statement we modified a little bit too. Again, we ask that the right after the identification that the a confidence is recorded um, in the, it, it, the, the witness's confidence is recorded. Um, we're also asking that the witness's confidence be recorded if they reject the lineup. So if they say the person's not here, how confident are they in that decision? Because that's really exonerating information uh, for a suspect um, if they're very certain that the, that the person who committed the crime is not present. Um, and all this has to be done, this confidence statement has to be taken by a blind administrator so that the administrator cannot influence the statement. Video recording, you should do it. Um, <laughs> um, we believe it should be recorded from the very beginning to the end so that all instructions given to the witness are there um, and that you have the confidence statement memorialized. Um, a new recommendation is we're specifically um, recommending that only one ID attempt be made with a particular witness and a particular suspect. Um, none of this repeat identifications. It doesn't matter how good of a reason you have to try again. Uh, I had a case in which um, the police officer, after the witness failed to identify the suspect, said, you know, I don't think that was a very good picture of him. I'm going to put another picture of him in. And then they went to the prosecutor and said, well, how do you think we should do this? And they said, oh, you need to get all new fillers. So they basically showed, <laughs> and, and, and shocking, they identified him the second time, right? And uh, this is a case of a non-blind witness, right? They told the witness who to, so they had a blind administrator administer the second lineup. So I told the defense attorney to ask the witness whether they recognized that the person was repeated. He's like, yeah, so that was the suspect, right? Yeah, um, so we don't want that happening. And it doesn't matter how good of a reason you have, you've got one shot, one shot only, and that's your ID. The first ID is the ID. And then finally, we're really recommending that show-ups not be used unless absolutely possible. We've got tons of data at this point that mistaken identifications are greater from show-ups. 
Um, if, there's, if there are grounds to arrest the person, independent of the eyewitness identification, there is time to conduct a proper identification procedure at the station with all the safeguards we've mentioned. Um, if, it is, um, if you have multiple witnesses, you could do the show up with one of them and save the rest of them for the good procedure uh, to back it up at the, at the station. Um, if it is necessary because you can't hold um, the suspect, um, you should follow as much of the procedure that you do for lineups with show ups. So you should instruct the witness that the person they're viewing may or may not be the culprit. You should video record the entire procedure with body cams now. That should not be a, a problem. And you should secure the confidence statement um, and so that all of that is recorded. <laughs> and that's it. Uh, and I'm happy to answer questions later. <laughs> Speedy. I was told I had 10 minutes. <laughs> Thank you. I sometimes get a little tremor, so yeah. that's great. All right, so I'm actually up here because I'm the world's worst eyewitness. Mm -hmm. I'm terrible at this. Um, but I want to talk about this, and I'm going to apologize to the folks who invited me here <laughs> because we were told to talk about best practices and things moving forward. And I'm just going to be really negative and talk about current worst practices because they're still going on from the lawyers. And maybe that's a way to get to best practices. So my view is we're still at a place where we have to look backwards because there are still cases in the pipeline where eyewitness error, the error by the eyewitness and or the error by the system that put this suspect in has left wrongfully uh, accused and convicted people in jail. Um, and related to that is that lawyers still don't investigate. I'm including lawyers for the prosecution, but my particular approach here is lawyers for the defense. And how do I know that? Either lightning has struck three times on me, or I've just stumbled on something that's going on a lot. Forgive me, here we go. So, what is this? This was shot with a cell phone camera, which obviously doesn't cost a lot of money, okay? This is from a wrongful conviction case here in Pennsylvania, where I was asked to help the Pennsylvania Innocence Project, where the front up here, where we are here, that's the barber shop. And the two eyewitnesses came out of the barber shop to have a smoke, and there's a shooting down at the corner. And they said we could tell it was Don Chip Patterson. And the lawyer never went to the scene and never took the pictures. Uh, can you even see what's going on or who's up there at the top? No. Okay, so that's me and some very nice guy who I said, can I pay you $5 to please be in the picture? You couldn't even see he had the dog in the earlier picture, right? That's embarrassing. Yet Mr. Patterson sat in jail because a prosecutor deemed credible a person's assertion that, stand, uh, we also walked it off as 100 plus feet, <coughs> that we could see and we are right. And this is a shooting that, in the light most favorable to the eyewitnesses, took five seconds where they saw things? Maybe. So that's Don Chip. So what's this one? This is another case. The difference is this crime scene is shot in the daylight. The crime was around midnight. This is in a project's um, out in northeast, lower northeast Philadelphia. And so the guy in the umbrella, that's me. Okay, I went out there with the sister of the convicted man because the lawyer never did it. And that's the view in sunlight. That case is currently on appeal because a judge decided there was no ineffectiveness for the lawyer not doing this. This is the current one I'm litigating where I will learn next week from the judge whether I even get an evidentiary hearing where the witness said it's about one or two in the morning, I hear something, and I look outside 
and walking past is a guy wearing a hoodie. The lawyer never went out. We shot these in daylight with someone wearing a hoodie standing outside the house, closer. You can't see. So until people start trying to recreate the crime and the opportunity to see, we have a problem. What about technology? Technology is maybe a better practice to rely on it, and I am a believer in it. I just want to tell a quick cautionary tale. Uh, this is Tamir Craig. Mr. Craig lived in a neighborhood in Delaware County, and there was a crime in the, this is the park. And a local grocer said, oh, that's Tamir. And Tamir gets arrested, even though he has a, a modestly good alibi, and his lawyer's begging and begging and begging. And until they sent the video to the FBI lab, which had the capacity to determine the height, and there was a five or six inch height differential <coughs> between the perpetrator and Tamir, Mr. Craig sat in jail based on what we think is a better practice using video capture. So certainly to be used, understand its limits. Uh, lawyers still need education. It's amazing to me to, uh, what lawyers don't know, and some of them still believe in the light bulb or flash bulb memory notion. By the way, a great book, if you haven't read it, it's called Memory. It's a history of the study of memory and all the stages that study has gone through, and of course, the National Academies report. So what might help? Okay, Margaret, congratulations. You help everyone call Margaret. All right. Um, so we've certainly had an evolution, if not indeed a revolution, thanks to Marissa Bluestein, who changed the law in Pennsylvania to get us to have expert witnesses in court. Sadly, it's not a fix. It's an improvement. It's a beginning. But first of all, how many places can you be at once, Margaret? I still don't have Hermione's time turner. So <laughs> OK, so we have a problem here. There aren't that many qualified, <laughs> available experts to go. OK? And sadly, and I'm going to talk about this in a moment, about the adversarial process. I heard a question about that this morning. It's not always the best place for a Margaret Cavera to teach people in a way that they'll get it because somebody's fighting with her. Um, how about jury instructions? You know a lot about this, don't you? Yeah, a little, a little bit. So certainly we now have several states with model jury instructions. I think it's fair to say that there's a question about their efficacy at least standing alone. To me, jury instructions are only as good as the lawyer who knows how to absorb them, to translate them, to incorporate them into the opening statement and the closing argument. So there's some stuff going on to have a more informed decision maker. But we're not yet at perfection. So what else? There's stuff that needs to be fixed. Because I was thinking, you know, we've got these new laws, and what is it? We still have no limits on what can be said in an opening statement or a closing argument. The I'll never forget that face. It would be remarkable for a judge to say, I'm not going to allow you to say that in your opening or your closing. It would be very creative also if defense lawyers started moving in limine to say, please don't allow that. But nobody does it. And a prosecutor might say it in good faith. I know the science generally, Cavera, but in this case, she'll never forget that. You know, what's a judge going to do? So we still have trials where the process is based on myth, on a scientific, if not anti scientific, information. So to me, I promised you, John, I'd finally get to something like on topic for today, all right? <laughs> it's be non-adversarial, all right? I'd, right? I used to spend a lot of time training defense lawyers. Okay. 
here's how you try and win an ID case. I don't want to do that anymore. Send me to the cops. Let me go to a good district attorney's office and say, I can actually help you get the right person and reduce the wrong person risk stuff. That to me is part of where we're going and need to continue. And I'm honored to say, Judge McKee and I have been asked by some national prosecutors organization, I forget which one now, we will right, we'll get there, right? <laughs> to be part of a webinar in June on training prosecutors on eyewitness issues and avoiding wrongful conviction. What a sea change. Um, what else? I actually think defense lawyers should be going earlier to the prosecutor and saying, hey, would you take a look at this case again? You need the right kind of community and communications, but to me, that's a fix, right? And then judicial and legislative commissions, because that's where we got that change in the map that we were shown. And when things get adversarial, because they still do, we're at least in a better age, because there are listservs where people can now get information and they can check out the experts from both sides. So to me, that's an advance, um, but none of it is yet fixed. And I think I'm done. Judge McKinney. Thanks, Rosal. With your permission, remain seated. Although I'm known in my court as a techie, I've never gotten to the point of PowerPoint. So I just kind of uh, sit around. Even use paper, even though I brought my iPad with me. Um, the task force that we're on, and we're really close. I think it's fair to say we're close to the end. Although I've said that for more than a year now. Um, one of the things that we'll be doing will be rolling out recommendations that will be, in fact, best practices for prosecutors primarily, but also for courts. Um, two of the things, almost all of them are included in Dr. Colbert's presentation. Two things that we don't have included, and I kind of wish we had, but they came out as you were there and knew, they came out after we got pretty far down the road. Having, suggesting, we can't really require, but suggesting that there be evidence for putting someone into a lineup or a photo display before the person is put in to minimize the risk of false, false positives. That's not something which we've discussed or tackled and we're not suggesting, although it seems just in terms of common sense like an excellent idea, given the analogies that we use to the, you know, test being someone for prostate cancer can be 12 or 15 years old. It doesn't make any sense. <clears throat> and also the uh, preliminary um, uh, interview, the pre-lineup interview, this is not something we consider. That's also a good recommendation. But again, I kind of wish we'd, we had. Otherwise, the things that you heard are pretty much what we're talking about doing, what we're trying to recommend. I do want to throw one little thing into the fire, and that is the in-court identification. Right now, our current jury instructions in the circuit, model, it's 4.15, contain an instruction, and I'm, I was shocked when I saw it, where the judge tells the jury that if the eyewitness uh, makes an identification in court, and the witness's certainty uh, of the identification remains unshaken, even after cross-examination, you may accept that as a statement of fact. And I was horrified when I read that. There's agreement, unanimous agreement on the task force, even among some of the people who are pushing back on other recommendations, that has got to come out. What I'd like to do, and we have not gone this far, and I don't, and Joseph correct me if I'm wrong, I don't think there's a snowball chance in hell of getting um, buy-in for it. But I'd like very much to preclude in-court identifications. Uh, they're absolutely meaningless. Um, the prosecutors on our, our task force recognize that they're meaningless. So if they're meaningless, and I therefore misleading, why allow it? Because there's almost nothing you can say to a jury to negate the impact of the witness on the witness stand, looking at the defendant saying, that's the guy, branded in my brain is the expression that I heard uh, when I was in common police court, never forget that very same thing. But it means nothing, obviously, because of the inherent suggestivity of the courtroom identification. I've not discussed this with any judicial colleagues, although I'm, I'm going to start doing this once our task force uh, report is out. But I do think that if judges are educated, and it's a huge task because we really need to be educated on this topic, because we don't know about it. We don't know <coughs> more about jurors, and all of this is counterintuitive. If judges are educated, um, and if a judge in the right case is told, Your Honor, I want to move to preclude in-court identification, 
tend to think an awful lot of the judges, I'm not sure if it would be the majority or not, but some would. If you get one person doing the right case, you prevent an injustice, an innocent person being convicted. Uh, I could see a judge saying, and I'm not going to allow you to make an in-court identification. A friend of mine who's a district court judge in Iowa has, as a matter of policies in his courtroom, no in-court identifications. <clears throat> and the, the, the policy actually grows out of a practice that he has. If there's to be an in-court identification, he tells the attorneys before the uh, trial begins that the defendant can place himself or herself anywhere that he or she wants to in the courtroom when the identifying witness comes in. And when I heard about this, I said, you know, well, Mark, I mentioned his name now, how do you deal with the right to counsel? Because while the defendant is in the back of the courtroom, he doesn't have the right to communicate with counsel. I said, well, I get a colloquy. I do a very thorough on the record colloquy. I explain to the defendant why I'm doing this. I explain to the defense counsel. And I get the defendant and his attorney, you know, say his, to make it easier than his or her. Obviously, these cases are usually male. I get them to, on the record, waive any right they may otherwise have to communicate directly during the course of the proceedings for the period of time that the witness is on the witness stand. He said, that's never a problem. And what happens is, before the identifying witness comes in, the defendant will sit somewhere in the courtroom, anywhere. And then when the witness is told to look around the courtroom and see whether or not the person that they saw that night is in the courtroom, it's much more uh, real of identification. And I asked him what the result of that is, and he said, the result is, the prosecutor never asked for any court ID. They just stopped doing it. So I say as a practice of no IDs, it's, his practice is not no in-court identification. His practice is, if you're going to try to get an in-court identification, it's going to be a real look around the courtroom. It's not going to be, try to look past the black guy sitting at the council table next to the white guy in the court in tie and tell me whether or not you recognize anybody, which is tantamount to what um, they are told. The, the problem in this area, it seems to me, really is one of education. I, it's not in anyone's interest. It's not, certainly not in the defense counsel's interest, not in society's interest, not in the prosecutor's interest, to allow an innocent person to stand trial for and be subject to conviction or be convicted for something they did not do. And an awful lot of district attorneys realize that. And I'm finding there's some pushback between this federal state fiefdom nonsense. Um, but you can get past that, I think, with individual jurisdictions. And if you can get prosecutors who are willing to educate their line trial attorneys and police chiefs who are willing to educate their investigators, I think a real progress can be made. There's a wonderful memo, which I call the Yates memo. Sally Yates wrote it when she was uh, Deputy Attorney General, I think February of 2016, 2017. And that memo, basically, it's, it's, it's wonderful. It basically outlines everything we're trying to do with our task force best recommendations. Surprisingly, perhaps not surprisingly, the members in our task force who are currently aligned with DOJ are pushing back against those recommendations, which are their own policy. In fact, it's no longer referred to as the eighth memo, it's the February 2017 memo, almost like a, like a destalinization kind of thing. Um, but that is to say that the foundation is there. And this is the policy now with the FBI, DEA, ATF, when they investigate cases, that is their policy. So all you're doing is reminding them of their own internal uh, policy. The big bone of contention right now seems to me to serve, uh, turn around confidence statements. That they are important. My position, and I think that I know the position of the more majority of our task force is that confidence statements are important if they're obtained under what we call pristine conditions. And those are the conditions that Dr. Covera outlined. The instruction is crucial that the witness has got to be told that they don't have to identify anybody, that the investigation will continue whether or not an identification is made, and that the real culprit may not be present. Absent those kinds of identifications at the very beginning, we, we heard a mention about what we're trying to do, and that is to eliminate um, uh, unduly suggestive identification procedures. But the unduly, the unduly suggestive identification procedures is not necessarily where you've got the six foot four black guy surrounded by five white midgets. And the testimony is that it was a really tall black guy who did the crime. It's much more akin to a very unintentional, if you will, suggestion as to who the right person is through body language or showing the person to the witness twice, which is a huge no-no. The witness looks at a photo spread, can't pick out anybody. In fact, one of our meetings, this came up with a, 
uh, very internationally recognized police chief who, who talked about a situation where they had a bank robbery. And um, they put the suspect's picture into a photo spread and the, um, the witness said, geez, I'm not sure if that's the guy or not. I, I can't really pick anybody else out. And one of the uh, assistant officers said, well, let's put him in a lineup and maybe the witness will identify him. And, and the chief said, oh, I guarantee you she'll identify him from the lineup. Not from the bank robbery, but because she's seen his face before. And in some of the more prominent cases of wrongful identification, what has happened is that the person was identified in an identification procedure because they were the only face in the identifying procedure who had been shown twice. A prior photo array, the person wasn't picked out, they picked up in a lineup. And that is the only repeat from the photo array. So that, that's huge. If you have a pristine identification procedure with proper instructions being given, the suspect only being shown one time, the witness's statement of confidence, I think, at the time or immediately after that identification procedure is important to show how accurate the witness thinks he or she is. There's a body of research which I'm trying to narrow down, and I want to talk to Dr. Cavera more about this, and I just actually tried to call the person who I think may be the author of it um, on the way here. We're not getting into this at all in our task force report because it's too nuanced and, and it's, I don't know where we'd go with it. But there's at least one researcher who I think common sense would suggest is onto something. And that is people's personalities obviously differ. Some people are inherently sure of their opinions no matter what they're based upon. Other people are inherently likely to question their opinions no matter how sound they may be. And to take a confidence statement from a witness without having an idea of that witness's own personality, how likely the witness is to believe their own opinions no matter what, um, may elevate confidence statements above where they ought to be for a certain witness and may um, derogate it below what it should be for other witnesses. And it's, I've, I've tossed that out in some of our meetings. There's not a lot of traction to pick up on that because it means that you basically have to have a survey, a personality survey at the time of the identification procedure to find out what kind of personality am I dealing here with here in terms of confidence. That's not going to happen, not, not in my lifetime anyhow. So we're backing off of that. But that is the kind of thing that you ought to be aware of and sensitive to in this area. There's so many ways a identification can be suggestive without it being the proverbial red tie or the six foot five black guy in a field of, um, of white witnesses. A white, white killers. And I want to end with the fact that judges really do need to be educated. When I got into this process, I, I got into it because of a particular opinion that I knew it was an issue and I had a concurring opinion in a case that I thought would give me a, an area to try to get this out there into the Third Circuit discussion. But the more I've gotten into it, I'm amazed at how uninformed people are. By way of example, at our very first task force, task force meeting, one of the members on the task force is an incredibly experienced and very, very highly respected defense attorney. He was a public defender and then he went into private practice several years after that. is very highly respected. He teaches at numerous NIDA institutes around the country. At the end of our first session with a colleague, actually, Dr. Bovera, Dr. Dysart gave a presentation about memory formation, memory retention, memory derogation. This attorney's response was, geez, I never knew any of that stuff. Uh, and I asked him how many ID witnesses he tried, and he said, geez, I can't keep track, but an awful lot. Um, so it's something that we're not really aware of. Judges are, I think it's fair to say, not anxious to admit their own ignorance or our own ignorance, but this is an area where judges really need to be educated. And the bottom line is we have to come up with language to get to juries, so that the juror who, when all else falls, will say, well, you know, she saw the guy sitting there on the witness stand and she had that incredible encounter and she said she'd never forget his face. And if she says that's the guy, to me, I'm convinced beyond a reason without that's the guy. And that statement will be made in all good faith without any uh, context to place it in. Witnesses, when they're cross-examined, that's the other area, the problem in this area, it's really hard to cross-examine an ID witness because they really believe they're right. And so the more you cross-examine them, the more hostile they become to you. You've got somebody who is, take it a rape case, where it's an ID case. You've got someone who's already been incredibly traumatized, a very sympathetic witness. You can't really tear into that witness and tell them that they're wrong. You can suggest the circumstances around the identification were not ideal for making an ID. She is then going to tell you about the proximity, and I'll never forget that face, and I was trying to remember that face because I didn't want him to do this to anybody else. And obviously the faces um, within inches of one another. 
um, even the best of lighting conditions or, or bad lighting conditions, that would suggest to you a very strong context to get a good ID. But yet all the social science would suggest that there may well be forces at work there that will derogate the identification that won't be as good as the witness thinks it is, uh, and so the a for identification simply doesn't, it ought not to be as um, suggestive as, as accuracy uh, as a juror might, might think. But getting jurors to believe that is difficult. And jury instructions, I think, are the only way to do it. If judges are not properly informed, they're going to run into, run into problems about what they're allowed, what they're allowed to communicate to, uh, to the jury. Uh, so it's an uphill task, but I do think that the light, the, the stars are coalescing, or less coalescing, or aligning, and so there is an opportunity to make some minimal inroads. And even though the inroads might be minimal, again, you get one case, and you save somebody from maybe being executed for something he or she didn't do, or being uh, um, relegated to prison cell for 10, 15, 20 years for something he or she didn't do. And so we shouldn't begin to think because we're making small changes, or only, there's only small amounts of uh, progress here that that doesn't matter. To the one person whose life is spurred by this, it, it matters a tremendous amount. Uh, Professor Epstein, you said you had a question? Oh, go okay. for theirs first. Okay. <laughs> uh, we have lots of questions. Um, one question is about the fact that, given the fact that there is a high proportion of inaccurate identifications, I believe in the white paper, uh, when you reviewed field studies of identifications that were made, about a third are filler identifications. Uh, how should we handle cases in which there's only an eyewitness identification and there's no other corroborating evidence? <laughs> yeah, that's a good question. Um, yeah. Well, I, I would say it depends upon uh, how the identification was obtained, right? Um, I would say that if it was an, obtained using problematic procedures, I would suggest that the case, you know, the, the identification be excluded and therefore the, the case is dismissed, right? Um, I know that's hard. Like, the, the, they don't like to do that. <laughs> um, but I, th that would be my preference. Um, you know, I, I, there are cases in which I consult where the police have done everything right, right? And, and in that case, then. I would proceed with the case and and then perhaps have an expert talk about the fact that even when everything is done right, there can still be mistakes, you know, be mistakes, which is what some of the field studies show. You still get about a third of filler picks, um, even when everything is being done correctly, uh, which suggests that there's memory errors. Maybe you're ta we're talking about that instead of me getting up there and saying the procedures were problematic and suggestive. May I jump in? Of course. So not going to disagree, but I want to add a layer to this. Um, it's a function of the crime. If it's a 30 second crime, it's radically different than if it's a 30 minute crime. It's a function of the time between the crime and the arrest. And so to me, in a weird way, that is actually other evidence, right? It's not a, a, that I had the credit card of the victim. Um, and that's why I said up there, uh, to me, the most important thing for any prosecutor or defense attorney, and maybe for any judge who's assessing any of this stuff, is to recreate the crime. Um, unless you stand where that was at that time of day or night and see what barriers there are and don't trust, well, it took two minutes, act it out. So he put the gun in my head, said, give me your wallet. I gave him my wallet, and he left. Felt like two minutes, but it certainly wasn't. So I'm not sure that's good science, what I'm saying, Margaret, but no, I, that's an intuitive I, add on. I, and, I, and I think that the problem is, is that jurors don't know that on their own, right? right? That those sorts of things. And so I think that you then need somebody, either whether, I mean, I could say, sorry, okay, judges' no, instructions, but the research is showing they don't work. So. Uh, <laughs> I, 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 um, the, I mean, all the research that's coming out on the Henderson instructions out of New Jersey suggests that they don't actually have any influence on uh, jurors' decisions. Um, have somebody explain to them how memory works and the types of variables that influence the likely accuracy. 
other than procedures, right? So if it's a cross-racial identification or if there's a weapon present or, and, and certainly the sorts of things, you know, I, I've testified in cases where the witnesses have said things, they're, you know, if you actually go and you look at the scene, as you suggest, there's no way they could have seen what they said they saw. Um, but um, unless that's pointed out to a jury, it's not clear to me that they understand that a lot of times. So, I, I yeah. guess I was just raising that though, because I thought the question was, what do you do sort of at the front end, which was the decision to prosecute. Right, yeah. And so I'd want the prosecutor and the prosecutor and the investigators to do that. And I would agree, and I understand the problems with the jury instructions, and I could be wrong here, I thought the information coming out of the Henderson Commission was they just disregard the ID altogether, is that? Um, there's, a, there's, a, there's about four, at least four studies now that at least as the Henderson instruct, instructions are written. Yeah, one of them I think was done by a fellow here, Chris Williamson. Amanda. Oh, Amanda, Amanda Purple. Yeah, she was, yeah. she, was my, she was my student. Okay. okay. <laughs> <laughs> and she didn't do that one with me, but yes, she did. Um, yeah, there's a, there's a series of uh, studies now um, out of Steve Penrod's lab, which Amanda was working in, as well as um, there's another set of researchers looking at this. And they've all found that as written, the, inst the instructions make you, might make you more skeptical of the identification, but don't actually help jurors differentiate okay. uh, between those that are uh, witness under good conditions um, mm -hmm. and those that are not. And that's, that, that's is as written, and I do think it's, it's difficult. So, right, so there's one study yeah. now, um, I, I, I don't think, that, I'm not sure that they're replicating it, but they do have one study showing that if you modify the instructions in a to make them more psychologically friendly for jurors, mm -hmm. basically to um, talk in a way that jurors are going to better understand and using some rhetorical twists that make it um, easier for them to grasp mm -hmm. um, the same information that if you do those, that it seems to help. It's not, it's not certainly not a fix, right. but it does, it does help educate yeah, the jurors. I don't know what else you do. If you've only got an identification witness, um, I don't know what else you can do. Um, and even when this corroboration, if the only corroboration are other ID witnesses, well, one of the most famous cases, um, well, not, not, in the case I had, the thing I wrote, there are three ID witnesses. That's not one of the famous cases, but some of my colleagues based their dissent on the fact that there's no prejudice here because there are three people IDing the same guy, um, but the, we call them system and, and then estimated variables. The estimated variables that would tend to suggest the accuracy of that I, uh, I would decide identification just went out there. There were things like this is system variables, actually, the instructions given to the witnesses and uh, those kinds of things were not present. Um, so even if you have multiple IDs, I don't know that that really solves the problem. I, the only way I can think of is trying to come up with language, and I agree it's difficult, to get jurors to look at the identification in an appropriate method and assess it in a way that's consistent with the research and the science, as opposed to just saying, Oh my God, how could that person forget the face? They said they'd never forget it. Um, it convinces me beyond a reasonable doubt, but it's, it's very difficult. And I will say one thing with show-ups. I don't think show-ups are, are they're really fraught with danger. I wouldn't say they necessarily should be banned. I do think there ought to be a restriction on time, and I think some jurisdictions, either by practice or by statute, uh, say that it's got to be within two hours. And to me, that two hours seems long. It's more like 10, 15 minutes. But sometimes it does seem to me a quick way to get someone who's clearly not the person, but happened to be in the vicinity, and have that person exonerated by the witness saying, no, that's not the person. But there again, the show up has got to be done under, quote, pristine conditions for the show up. The person should not be handcuffed in the backseat of the police car, surrounded by police officers and a couple of snarling canines, suggesting this guy is really dangerous, whoever the hell he is. Um, but if it's done, so you minimize the suggestiveness. By definition, it's going to be suggestive. But if you minimize that, and it's done very, very quickly, and the witness is told, look, we're not sure if this is the person or not, but we're going to take a, you take, to take a look at him. We're going to continue our investigation. Whether or not you say this is the right person, just take a look at the person and tell us whether or not you think this is the person. And if you do think this is the person, how certain are you of that? To me, I don't think that's necessarily bad, and I don't really have any way around it. And it may be a way of getting someone out of the prosecutorial focus early on. So one thing that came up, I believe, in all of your guys' comments is this question of training. So in the National Academy's report, one of their five recommendations was that police officers need to receive more training about memory issues. We've talked about training for prosecutors or judges. What does that look like? Are there specific 
techniques or ways we're thinking about training that might be particularly effective because it's a, cha it's a challenge uh, in a lot of different ways. The judges, the training looks like that screen. <laughs> <laughs> nothing. <laughs> She's not there. Go ahead. Um, the first rule, I think, is it's best when cops train cops. Mm -hmm. um, and I've been to some trainings where cops come in and train cops, and they feel safer than when pointy-headed Jules Epstein comes in and trains them. Um, and especially when it's a cop who was involved in a wrongful conviction and can say, I did everything like you did and I was convinced I got the guy and I was wrong. Um, the second thing I want to say just real quickly is it's more about honey than vinegar. So I found in the few times that I've trained police or police and prosecutors, when I'm saying, here are the better ways to reduce the error and make it more likely you will get the right person, that that's also a friendlier selling point than saying, excuse me, but you're just jerks. Right? You've been yeah. doing this thing wrong, and you're probably going to do it wrong tomorrow. Uh, so those are my two comments. I think you're right. When I've when I've spoken to police, I, I, I most of my research has been on double-blind practices, and so um, <laughs> it, it's a hard sell because basically I, I wouldn't point out the person, you know. I would, and you know, I have to bend over backwards to really talk about it being an unintentional process. Everybody does it. We don't test new drugs without double-blind procedure because we. It's not that we don't trust doctors um, or patients. Uh, we but we know that there's these fundamental human biases that come in um, that influence. Uh, our behavior, at, once we have expectations of what other people are going to do, it changes the way we treat them, and then that changes what they do. Um, so I think that bending over backwards to say, look, you know, I'm, I'm here to help you get the right person and to do your job better. Um, and so certainly with audiences, I shift sometimes the focus of preventing wrongful convictions to getting the right guy. Um, uh, depending upon the audience. But certainly it's like, I don't think any of these practices are necessarily going on because people are bad people. Uh, they don't understand how memory works. And so what we've tried to do in the white paper is to try and explain the, re and we explicitly say, it's not so much that you follow these particular things that we've said you should do, but that you recognize the spirit behind the recommendation um, and that you understand the memory principle behind it. So, because oftentimes, like the case with the prosecutor who, you know, the police officer thought he had the wrong, you know, that he used a bad picture and wanted to try again. I don't think the prosecutor was a bad person. I don't think the police officer was a bad person. I think they didn't understand what they were doing was going to influence the witness in a suggestive way. Um, and so if we can train everybody to think about it in those psychological terms, I think that when they have to wing it and deviate from the guidelines, they'll do so in a more principled way that is less suggestive. Uh, sort of on that vein, double-blind procedures have been one of the recommendations that have received the most pushback. So uh, somebody was asking, and sort of in general, how can we combat these challenges to the adoption of best practice principles? Why, if we say this in the way, you're preventing wrongful convictions, you're increasing the likelihood that you're getting the right guy, why is there such a challenge in getting these procedures adopted when, as you said, the initial white paper was published and the NIJ guidelines were published in the late 90s? Um, I, I, you know, I, I hear from police officers that they can't do the double blind procedure. They don't have the resources. They don't have the. There's nobody who in their um, stays, you know, how station house that the note does not know who the suspect is. So it's impossible for them to follow the procedures. Um, I like your idea of having cops talk to other cops because, and, and I've got my hometown cops, in New, so I live in New Jersey and where Henderson came down and so I, uh, and where, where they now, and the Attorney General mandated double blind procedures be used quite some time ago and so I was at a wine dinner um, and at the end of the night because they were friendlier than, I, I put my police officers uh, from my town were there and I live in this little town and, and I, I was like, well, if they have problems doing it, you know, I, I bet now I could get them to tell me because they've been drinking a lot. Um, so I, I said, you know, hey, I, I work at John Jay. Um, tell me, can you tell me about your experience with double blind procedures? Is there ever a situation where you're, you know, it's too hard for you to do? Like you're a small shop, 
And they're like, no, why would we do it? It's great. We just call the next town over. So I think, you know, the, the, the jurisdictions that have figured out how to do it with limited resources can, are probably the best people to talk to the others about how to get around the problems um, and to talk about how it hasn't changed the, like it makes it easier for them when they go to court. They don't have to face somebody like me um, when they um, come in. And so I think that, that, I think that's a great suggestion on your part. The police chief on our task force came up with a way of having officers in a one officer jurisdiction do it. Uh, he says usually he brings somebody from a neighboring jurisdiction and he's never had a problem, but if that's not the case, he calls it a folder shuffle, where you take it very similar to the envelope, so the envelope, where you just take the, the Atlanta pass or the photo he has six people, take six manila folders, put one picture in each folder, you shuffle them so you don't know which folder contains the picture of the defendant, pass the folders to the witness, tell the witness just mark the folder that has the picture, take the folders back, then ask the question about, this is after, after the instructions have been given that we talked about, ask the witness how certain are you of the identification, and then after the witness leaves, then look to see which photo was picked. Now that, I don't, that's double blinding or blinding, but it's certainly a way that is consistent with the principles of double blinding. And, and it's one of the pushbacks that we've gotten in the terms of confidence statements, because there's some research, and I think it all cites back to one researcher whose name I think is in the white paper. And his theory, his theory is that uh, confidence statements, no matter what, trump everything. Even in the absence of any kind of blind or any kind of instructions, if the witness is absolutely certain, um, that trumps everything. To me, that is like going to a pharmaceutical company and, and saying, well, yeah, none of your instructions were double blinded at all, but. Um, we're going to accept the, the, the trials of the drug anyhow. It just is contrary to common sense. And we're liking to push that argument too far because in my leisure time, I like to read quantum mechanics. And nothing in quantum theory makes any sense. It's all counterintuitive. So I feel like a hypocrite when I'm saying that's contrary to common sense because the universe that we live in is so contrary to common sense. But this is a system where quantum theory, I don't think, really applies other than the physical makeup of the materials. Um, so to me, it just seems so inherently contradictory to what we know makes sense that I don't understand the, the pushback. Why wouldn't you do some kind of blinding procedure when if you think about it, you could do it? And as I said, this officer who's internationally known uh, has come up with a way of doing it in jurisdictions with only one officer. The officer who made the arrest knows who the guy is, can still do it in a way that um, protects that officer's subliminal communications from the identifying witness. You don't mind me adding. I, we specifically considered the, fo the folder shuffle yeah. method we and the, we, the white paper people. Um, and the problem with, that we found with the folder shuffle method, and we don't, because it's possible to track which folder is which if the person's, the, you know, you shouldn't, you know, if you're really doing it, but, but you could. And, and some of the, the behaviors are so subtle that even somebody who's watching may not pick up on, like, I, I, I have to code, we, we code all these videotapes of people doing these blind versus not blind procedures in my lab. And the, and the behaviors that are, can be very, very subtle that are cueing the witness. And so um, we just think it's better that the officer is completely outside the room. And we, um, and so, um, so that, the so not hanging okay, around. As long as the officer is not inside the room. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think. I think it's the same idea as what we're recommending for the for our uh, envelope method. But some some level, we just like having like the, there's nothing that they're doing. They're not worrying. They're not messing with the placement of it. There's not the and witnesses can look for funny things. Like they could say they they think they saw them doing something with the folder. This way, they can't see them doing anything with it. They. I mean, even if the person is blind and doesn't know. The witness could think, well, they really do know, and I saw them look at that folder longer, and what you know, people can come up with all sorts of reasons to justify what they're doing. We know that from psychology, and so just to remove all of that, um, I, I mean, I'm a social psychologist, so I'm interested in social interactions and social influence, um, as opposed to Wick said, who's all about memory, um, and I like, you know, I, I, I'm interested in how the social influence and, and, and how people think about events influences their choices. And so just to remove as much as you can of that social influence from the situation, I think, will allow you to reduce their suggestiveness. That's why we just want them out of the room. And that way there's just no question. And you have it on videotape that they're out of the room. And that goes back to <laughs> so do it on videotape. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 
Uh, we had a few questions about the recommendation for the evidence-based suspicion to put somebody in a lineup. So currently there's not any sort of level of evidence or suspicion for that. So is, is that sort of universal, in which case there's no base rate right now? And can you go into a little bit more detail about what, what constitutes evidence-based suspicion? Yeah, I, yeah we're, we're, that's one of the revisions we're making to the white paper right now is to give examples. <laughs> so let me see if I can come up with some. I, I was just tasked with doing that this morning. Um, <laughs> um, I'm better at identifying what it is not than what it is. Um, I mean, certainly if you have other evidence, if you have, um, if the person, you find them near the scene of the crime within a very short period of time and they match a detailed description given by the witness, not like a general high, you know, male black or male Hispanic or male white, you know, that's... Yeah, wearing a coat. Yeah, yeah, we're, we're, yeah wearing a coat that, that every, you know, wearing one of those Canadian goose jackets that everybody's wearing these days, right? That, that's not a very specific description. But if they say they had a tattoo on their right arm, you know, something like that, where it's a very specific description, that's evidence, right? That's evidence that that could be the person. Um, I would say, caution on that, though, I, I was working a case um, in which the police found a young man who had a record driving in an area of an armed robbery. And there had been a series of armed robberies in that neighborhood. So they put him in the lineup for one, the one that he was in the neighborhood for, he was not identified. And then they put him in the ID, after he was not identified, then they put him in a bunch of other ID procedures and he was picked out of one of them. And then they tried him for it. There was no n connection of this young man to that crime over here, because he, uh, according to the witness, he didn't commit the other armed robbery for which he was in the neighborhood. So once that ID didn't happen, they have no evidence to place him in that other one. And it was a bench trial, and the ju judge did acquit the young man. But it, it was a horrible, I mean, he was 18, it was really sad. Um, so I, you know, I, I think that some things that look like evidence to police are not good evidence. So I've worked another case in which uh, a guy did steal a TV, they caught him stealing the TV, and he's sitting at the police station, and he happens to sit, a, sit under a composite sketch drawn by a witness to a, uh, a rape victim. And the police officer says, hey, that guy looks like the guy in the composite. And so they put him in an ID procedure, and the witness identif identifies him. The problem is, is we know the composite sketches don't look like the people they're supposed to represent. Uh, we know that, but the police don't know that. And so what might look like good evidence to them actually is not. And so I think it's going to, it's a novel recommendation. I think it's going to be one that's going to end up becoming more detailed over time as we try and work it out. But I, I, th I think more the general idea is to not do things like, run your files for somebody who fits the general description of race and age and has committed the same crime in the last 10 years in that neighborhood, right? That, put, that doesn't put them, connect them to this particular crime. And I see that happen all the time. Um, I, I, if we can get rid of some of those basic practices or mug book searches. Let's get rid of those because, again, just the fact that somebody ID somebody after looking at, I think the New York Times just had after, looked at 800 photos and then identified somebody after looking at 800 photos, um, that, you know, that, that doesn't con really connect, that's not a, something that should connect them to this particular crime. Um, and so I, I think it's something that we're going to have to work out with, uh, in connection with police and I would welcome the collaboration of doing that to try and think about what types of things would constitute better evidence than what is currently being used, at least in the cases I see. We're trying to, compo to discourage all use of composite sketches. Uh, I remember I had one time, uh, to show you how ignorant judges are on this, when I was a common police court judge, I remember a bench trial and I was amazed at how closely the defendant resembled the composite sketch. Thank goodness there's a lot of other evidence connecting the defendant to the crime. But the more I've learned about this, I realized, well, of course the defendant resembled the composite sketch. He was arrested not because he looked like the culprit, but because he looked like the composite sketch. Uh, and that's not how, you know, when you put a composite together, you see someone on the street, you don't think, oh, well, that's the person's nose, that's the person's eyes, that's the person's ears, that's the person's forehead. That's not how our brains work. But yet, that's how a composite sketch gets put together. One of Dr. Covera's um, colleagues has a slide presentation in which he shows 
I think it's, is it nine or 12 jewels? Oh, the, the one of the, the composites. The composites from California, the rape case? Yeah, the serial rapist. To a marriage in California, DNA is connected, all of the rapes to the same rapist. She puts up a, 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 a slide that has all of the various composites that have been derived from the descriptions of this rapist. And they don't look anything, you've got nine or 15 composites, and they look like totally different people, but yet the DNA establishes it's exactly the same person who was the serial rapist. You would never know it from looking at the composite sketches. And it's, it's a very powerful demonstration of how inaccurate composites are. And we really are trying to, in our task force support, trying to get police officers to realize, just don't do composite sketches. We know you got an artist on staff, and there's probably something else you can probably figure out for that person to do, but don't have them do composite sketches in ID cases. So we talked a lot, uh, this panel, about sort of what the current state of the field is. I want to get each of your thoughts on sort of where the future is going. So uh, what's the most important thing to put our focus on? Is it changing police procedures? Is it changing the way that prosecutors uh, think about memory evidence and charging decisions? Uh, where do you see the future of eyewitness identification in the legal system? Can we start with you, Jules? Sure. Well, first, I have to give a shout out to Barry Sheck, who's here, because he, was, he is part of the future, which is doing his annual forensics college training. But that's training defense lawyers, but it's the most consistent, ongoing effort to make sure people do get the education. Um, if I were beyond the fact that the psychological research is constantly um, going and growing, to me, the most important, if we're serious about reducing eyewitness identification error, has to be before we get to the courtroom, yeah. all right? And so to go back to your uh, basic question, it would be um, do a week of training with 20 important prosecutors in the room and let them undergo eyewitnessing experiences and see their own error rate and then continue that training and then talk to them about what science shows is will get you closer to the right person more of the time but again the more I do this and I've been doing my witness work for maybe a decade it's please fix it before we get to the courtroom the courtroom's way too late your turn Ditto. <laughs> Ditto, what he said. Oh, yeah. um, I mean, I'm thinking, I guess, in terms of research, what do I see coming out? Um, and I, to me, I think um, there's more, so there was this pendulum swing a little bit that a lot of the early researchers were trained as social psychologists, and then um, the people you were mentioning in terms of the confidence issues became, uh, were cognitive psychologists and they have a particular theory that they use to study eyewitness identifications. And it really removes the identification procedure from the social interaction that I believe is what's going on in that room um, between an administrator and the witness. And so um, I think there's some pushback at this point where we're gonna see more people looking at the ways in which social influence operates. I think one thing we haven't really even tackled because we've been assuming that all of this is, is um, j just the police using practices that have been handed down and not really understanding this, the science of it. But I'm also seeing a lot of gang cases, um, really coercive tactics being used to get um, people to identify others. And so it's, it's not, your ID procedure, it is basically using interrogation techniques like the read technique, which we know it, it increases false confessions, and using it on witnesses to get them to identify people. Um, and I think that um, it's something that the eyewitness researchers have really not tackled, because it, 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 we've, we've been trying to be play nice, right? Like, but there's some really intentional things going on to try and force witnesses to make identifications when the police believe that they know who it is. 
Um, and I think that that may be the next thing that we have to tackle is to really demonstrating how those tactics can get people to false, knowingly falsely identify people. Because we've seen it in some of the exoneration cases where there's recantations years later because of these types of pressure tactics. Um, and so I think that that might be something that comes up in the future. Yeah, that I find very scary. Yeah, my, my, too. <laughs> my response is assuming you don't have that situation. <laughs> when you have that situation, um, you got a real problem. But I really think education, I, I totally agree with what Jules said, that hopefully it can be done, the pristine conditions and all the things we've talked about can be done before the case gets to the courtroom. Once you get to the courtroom and you put those 12 folks in the box, talk about randomization. The things get really, really risky and hurry at that, hurry at that point. But if there's one thing I would suggest that uh, no matter how certain the identification people in the uh, particular case are, as soon as we've gotten this round up, and that is Julius's point, go to the scene. I'll just briefly recount a war story many years ago, more than I like to admit, when I was a trial judge in County Police Court. I would never get a case that had a bench trial. It was a, a robbery of a liquor store. And the testimony was that this guy came out of the liquor store, and these two witnesses saw him at 2 o'clock in the morning, and they were within 30 to 35 feet of the guy as he ran out of the liquor store into his car and drove off. And they were certain of their testimony. They had a clearer profile of the guy's face. Uh, the lighting was good. It was 2 in the morning with the street lighting and neon signs. And so I thought to myself, you know, nothing to be lost. We'll just go to the scene. The stenographer was crazy, thought I was crazy, because with 2 in the morning we're going up to a pretty rough area of Kensington in, in Philadelphia. And we, ironically, as I'm driving up with a detective, he was in a plane car. I can't tell you how many times as we stopped at stop signs, somebody tried to sell us some drugs. So, <laughs> you know, we get to the uh, location and basically said, yeah, that's what it looked like that night. So we set up the little court thing. I'm sitting in the stupid steps, the doctor is sitting out there, people looking out the window saying, what in the heck's going on? And I asked the uh, defense attorney to just take some people, and he had brought some people from his office, and just walk towards me. And I knew one of the three people walking towards me was the defendant. I spent the entire day staring at the defendant from my bench to the defendant, maybe 15, 20 feet in the courtroom. So I wanted to see how close these three could get before I could pick the guy out. He was about 10, 12 feet in front of me before I could say that was the defendant I saw. Uh, in the courtroom today, and it dawned on me, there was no way. And I'm looking right at the guy's face, coming full on, focusing on it. And I know one of these three people is the defendant, and I'm just asking myself, when will I be able to pick up the defendant's face? And there's no way in the world those witnesses could have seen this guy coming out of the liquor store from a distance that they described themselves as being, and just like that of his profile. So it was an acquittal. And afterwards, actually, the officer, to his credit, came up to me and he said, you know, Judge, I thought you were crazy when you suggested we do this because he had two witnesses who were sure of the guy. And he said, you know, thank you. I didn't want this on my conscience. I'm glad we did this. And I said, when did you know that was the defendant walking towards me? He said, well, actually, he had to get a little closer to me than he did to you. That's maybe seven or eight feet before I knew that was the defendant. And he said, what makes it worse is I knew what the guy was going to be wearing <laughs> because he wasn't in custody. But I knew what he had on. I knew the color shirt he was going to have on. And that was the only one of the three with that color shirt on. But the lighting was such, it was a dark gray shirt, I think, and it blended in. He had to get that close before he could see, well, that guy's got the great dark gray shirt on. It really was an eye-opener to me. So if you can get the participants in the scene, in the, in the uh, trial, to at least do that much. It's a lot harder with the jury, uh, but you can still certainly do it. Logistics get kind of crazy when you got 12 people going to really dilapidated, uh, challenged as part of a large city at 2 in the morning, but it can be done. And a lot of judges will give you pushback, but if they're properly educated, some, I think, probably will. If that's qualified to us in different ways. And again, if you can do it in the right case, just if you save one person, it's like the old starfish story that some of you may have heard of. If people have a little girl throwing starfish into the sea, and when told what you're doing is futile, you can't save them all, and she throws one into the sea, and she says, well, I saved that one. <laughs> and I mean, that, maybe that's why I get through the day, because I'm a real pessimist. I try to look for little bits of hope here and there to kind of justify my doing my job, but you, you can maybe make a difference in a case, and realistically speaking, you'll make a difference in more than a case, and that's, I think, all we can hope for. I just like, I'll, I want to add that I think that if we actually get the police officers to videotape the administrations, that that will change practice going forward for everybody, because then we will have a documentation 
of what happened um, and instead of relying on people's memories to tell us what they think happened. Um, because if the ID memories are vague, you know, I, I just think about what there, there are some jurisdictions that are videotaping and we, ha we had a guy, a police officer who was swearing he was blind. I was in possession of an email showing that he had the name of the suspect at least. And when he was reading the instructions to the witness where he got to the blind part where he says, I don't know who the suspect is, he stumbled on it and, and then didn't read it. Um, I think that was pretty compelling evidence. And I think that you know, indicated to me that he knew, he, that he did in fact know who the suspect was and he'd been lying. Um, and so I, that, that's a pretty dramatic situation. But I think being able to document um, better than, we, than often happens, who the fillers are, how they look in, in relationship to the suspect, uh, the types of instructions that are actually given as opposed, we know that the people use schemas when they're trying to remember and police officers have to have schemas or scripts that, they, that you know, they're supposed to say X, Y, and Z in the instructions. They'll remember saying those things because that's what they're supposed to say, whether they said them or not. And so when they're reporting it, they could misreport, again, unintentionally, I'm not saying that they would necessarily do it on purpose. It doesn't have to be lying. It could be a misremembering because they know, they just happened to skip over it because they got distracted or something and didn't read that part of the instru instruction. So I think that documenting it will provide um, information for judges and prosecutors and defense attorneys that will, and jurors potentially, that will help them all uh, perform their jobs. But even um, with better. videotape, if it's not pristine, jurors are not going to know because they're not, not going to see anything which is going to do reflect in their mind as something that an officer would do to suggest an identification to a witness. Unless they're told that in the jury instructions and then you get any research about I have data that evidence. says that they do. Right. I have data that says that they do. That they do what? They, they can tell. Really, uh, yeah, if it's really su if it's really suggestive, I've got some. Well, really suggestive. Well, I keep putting rabbit. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, no. It, um, but what I would consider really suggestive may not be what other people consider really as suggestive. But um, they they are picking up on on um, cues that are being given, um, even just changes in, in the types of questions that um, and, and feedback and things like that. So. Um, and without the benefit of an expert, they're getting it if they see it. Like if they hear it, they don't do it. If they see it, it's something else. And so we have some data suggesting that the videotaping does help them help. Yeah. So I wanted to add two more things to the future, all right? Um, one is the future sort of sitting down two people from me uh, because we're at a remarkable time where judges are stepping up. Uh, Judge Jed Rakoff was on the... Uh, NAS committee uh, and just wrote a wonderful piece in the New York Review of Books. Um, and I have to tell you how remarkable it was to be invited to sit in a room with Judge McKee and a whole bunch of other people because they could bring people to the table that I can't. Um, and when judges step up like that, it makes a difference. The other, and Margaret, maybe you can help me here, um, beyond the cognitive psychologists and the social psychologists, mm -hmm. Uh, what about t people like Tom Albright, who's a vision scientist, right? So we're getting some remarkable research yes. from people like him. I think he's at the Salk Institute. It could be. Yes, yeah. and uh, he was the co-chair of the um, NAS committee. Well, I specifically picked people for the NAS committee who, who were not, not I would I speak, but, yeah. but, <laughs> um, but, but no, I think there are interesting things about, um, especially you were talking about the color of the shirt, right? And I, I'm going to pull out my intro to psych lecture, um, <laughs> um, but, but, but how dark it is affects one's color perception, right? And so when somebody's describing a color, when they witness it at night, it might not actually be the color they think it is because of the lighting. Um, and so I, I think that those, you don't see a lot of that type of testimony in these cases, but it is an area for research that could be interesting. So we only have just a couple of minutes left, so I wanted to give everyone an opportunity if they have any final comments, questions, things that they would like to point out about the field that we haven't touched upon. I have a question for Margaret. Uh -oh. No. <laughs> so I, I paid really close attention to when you went through the recommendations. I was shocked at one. Which one? So help me explain okay. why I'm wrong. Uh, that one of the things the police should do with this very prompt interview is ask the eyewitness, 
how much attention were you paying? Mm. And of anything, I thought that's the most inaccurate aspect of self-reporting. So help me out there. Um, Does that make sense? What uh, no, I, I, um, but they regularly asked it. And we know that the reports of how much attention they paid changes over time as a function of Got feedback. It. Got and it. So, 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 so the idea is that we know they're going to be asked it at some point in time. And we know that feedback um, that confirms their choice of, of a suspect changes not only their confidence, but also their report of how, how close they were, how, 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 how much time to, you know, they so got to see the, the face. So the idea is to get the initial uncontaminated report, because it's amazing how many times I see cases in which they say, you know, I didn't get a good look. I wouldn't be able to identify him if I saw him. Uh, I didn't get a good look. And then all of a sudden, they identify him somebody from the lineup, okay. and then at, and I, you know, no, it's burned in my memory. So, you know, you go from, I, you know, I really didn't get a good look. I, I can't even describe them, let alone I pick them out of a lineup, and then they pick somebody out of the lineup when, because they're shown somebody and they think that what they're supposed to do is to pick somebody because the guy must be there, and then we end up. So, so it's really just an issue of memorializing the information Not at it. the time. Not that we think that people are great at time estimators, because we don't, right. um, or, or, you know, but um, it's better then than it would be later, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. uh, I want to, again, thank our three panelists. Um, I know I really enjoyed you guys' comments. I hope you all did as well and learned something. Um, and please join me in thanking them. And very good. Thank you.